It is not by moral outrage alone that people have lent their lives to the struggle for better worlds. Neither is for the purity of instruction from theory. There is certain no royal road, one, only the one made by walking. Many have walked, many have been forced to move, many have found roads while walking with others. These words are not mine. They are from my dear friend, Christina Atherton, from her wonderful book, Arise, Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution. The power of these words immediately resonated with me when I first heard them, and then when I read them. To explain their impact on me, I recall the words of the Brazilian singer, Martinho da Vila, when referring to a song, Valsinha, written by, the fellow, by his fellow musician, Chico Buarque da Holanda, he said he wrote the song I would like to have written. This same sentence can be applied to Atherton's words. She wrote the paragraph that I would like to have written. I call this healthy academic jealous, the one that nourishes us and inspire us to continue to do our walks and that inspire me to be here today with you all, to continue this conversation that is long in my head on building archives and writing histories through walking. Good evening. I am inspired to be here today with you after the screening of the Mangrove School in the hope that the film and the conversation that we are about to engage inspire you to continue to, to imagine and to do the walk or the multiple walks we have ahead. Marie Condé, in her novel, Crossing the Mangrove, wrote, you don't cross the mangrove, you would spike yourself in the roots of the mangrove trees. You will be sucked down and suffocated by the brackish mud. In 2020, my second trip to Guinea-Bissau, in the midst of the pandemic, I saw the mangrove for the first time, that until then was just a part of a distant imaginary I had when I first learned the word in 2014, the Ghanaian word for mangrove. Together with the amazing team of Sana Nahada, Jenny Lu, Filipa Cesar, Marinho Pina, and the warm Malafu community, Nsai, Pedro, Pereira, Sonfba, and many others that joined the journey, the mangrove school became a reality. We did not cross the mangrove, but we did indeed live, rest, work, and study and learn there without touching solid ground for hours long during the days during days. We went to Guinea-Bissau, this time to research the conditions of the students in the guerrilla schools, in the mangroves. Instead, we soon became ourselves the learners, and the first lesson we had was how to walk. walk walking is more than a simple movement of legs, using Rebecca Solnit's description in Wanderlust, A History of Walking. It starts, with, it starts and I quote, one leg, a pile, a pillar, holding the body upright within the earth and the sky. The other, a pendulum, swinging, swimming, swinging from, be, from behind. Heels touch down. The whole weight of the body rolls forward onto the ball of the foot. The big toe pushes off, and the delicately balanced weight of the body shifts again. The legs reverse position. It starts with a step and then another step, and then another step, and then another that add up, like taps on a drum to a rhythm, the rhythm of walking, end of quote. The movement of walking is more or less the same everywhere, but the way our feet cherish the ground differs depending on the different territories, different soils, different grounds that we step in. It differs too, according to the people one meets on the way while walking, and it differs too of how much one wants and doesn't want to be noticed. Pisar a terra suave, to gentle press the soil. The mix between gentle and firm 
is more or less how you walk in Guinea-Bissau, in the village, in the rice fields, in the mangrove, on the asphalt, on the paved sidewalk, or even on the road dirty track. To walk in the Bulanya, the rice fields in English, your walk change every corner. Not that, not that we can talk about corners in a rice field, but more of transitions between water, leaves, mud, rice plants, and again, water, leaves, mud, rice plants, and the bugs and the footprints we find on our way that make us stop and think the best, way to the best strategy to move forward. In this strategizing, sometimes you step on the leaves and on the and on the low grass, in order not to slip and fall, as friction creates resistance. If you walk straight, placing your heels on the ground first, you promptly fall, slip and fall in the dams of the floated rice fields, or you get stuck in a mangrove mud. To walk, you need to lower your body, flex your knees, and stick your toes vertically in the mud, extend your and in the mud, instead your, your arms forward in a conscious and present movement to keep your equilibrium. And then, as a child who is learning their first steps, you walk. Rafi Yaut, in the article Walking the International, mentions that when we walk, we scan with our eyes the surroundings, only glancing occasionally downwards on, at our feet, and rarely sensing them. Such, such a posture, posture is impossible in the mangroves, and therefore the same is valid when building the mangrove school. In the mangrove school, as in the, libera as in the deliberation struggle, the learning happens with the whole body. Going back in time, it was, it was 2014 when I first landed in Guinea-Bissau to continue the research I already had started in 2013 in Cape Verde and previous to that in Portugal and Berlin, from Europe to Africa, from the archipel to the continent. A small backpack, a heavy camera that, so of, that of so outdated uh, made me carry 60 tapes of film a tripod, a computer, a sound recorder, batteries, flashlights, and many other electronics would help me to survive three months of intense research on the PAGC liberation struggle. Little did I know of the obstacles ahead. The time I arrived and throughout all my stay in Guinea-Bissau, the country was transitioning from a coup d'etat from 2013 and preparing for new elections. Public, electri public electricity was almost unavailable, unless you had a generator. Water was only available for a few hours. That could be day, night, or dawn, in unspecified days. Public salaries or retirements had not been paid for months, and schools were, clo schools were closed, about to be declared year zero and students were manifesting from ages of six years old and were occupying the streets, reclaiming the right to school. And teachers of public sector were on strike. A strange combination of factors for someone whose goal was to study the liberation struggle and militant education. Under such conditions, how does one navigate in the city? Charge phone and camera batteries and your computer. My first walking experience was then in the search for the conditions, going from door to door of those who had a generator in the house to allow me, a stranger, to use a bit of their electricity power to charge my batteries of all my work equipment. Such walk forced me to, forced me to at the same time to present myself and my work, like in a kind of a clandestine mobilization campaign, as political fear was a norm for most of the people at the time. 
for water issue, that, are, that was another conversation. And I think it's clear from this that Bucket and Macbeth, in a well-reasoned manner, became the norm too. With this situation more or less under control, the second part of the walk started. Where do I find the people to interview? Where could I find the PSGC freedom fighters? or combatentes da liberdade, da pátria, how they are called there, who fought for independence and freedom of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde from, por from Portuguese colonial regime. Where do I find the archive? It was in this process of contact contacting possible interviews that very fast became or took a, sno a snowball effect that walking became an unaware important part of the research. In Guinea-Bissau, walking up and down the streets, knocking doors, asking for information, carrying kilos of materials in my back under burning sun, and, to find, a, and to, to find and interview someone who lives somewhere in streets where sometimes the cars don't have access. I walk at kilometers, or miles you prefer, if you prefer, you know I'm European. <laughs> and by the end of the day, the old body hurt, and the backs were sore, and the feet and legs swollen, and the body, body was sweaty of carrying all these materials. I sort of unconscious performance, performed the, walk, the walking during the liberation struggle. In Guinea-Bissau, I could not find a solid, a solid and traditional physical archive of the liberation struggle, the archive as we know it. I searched for them and could not find in the, traditional sp in the traditional places where normally archives are archived. From this search, the literal I could found, find was a small box with sparse documents and a huge table with an immense pile of mixed papers and dates in an unfinished warehouse with no windows and covered with spiders, their nets and their and other bugs. I could only access these documents at the brief, I could only assess the documents at the periphery of the table. The ones on the center were impossible to assess without dismantling the massive pile, paper pile, and dust installation. I was not allowed to be alone in the warehouse. There was a fear that I could steal something, so a guard was with me. I could not touch the documents without the traditional white glove for the sake of the document protection. Photos were not allowed. My movements were controlled, not just by the guard, but also by the immense heat in the room inside the military facility. Two afternoons of work, or two afternoons of work was what it took me to realize that that room would not lead me nowhere soon and I left in the search of other archives possibilities. Still, I continue to walk, finding addresses, following recommendations of people to interview, asking door to door for so and so. Only at the end of my research, when I was, ready, when I was already writing my PhD dissertation in Berlin, did I realize that the archive that, that so eager I was looking for and that and then, uh, sorry, uh, that the archive I so eager was looking for was then all on the walking and the different paths I walked to arrive to them. The people and the paths were the archive. They carried memories, the history and the stories. They carried the experiences, the knowledges and the scars of the liberation struggle. In Guinea-Bissau, they were everywhere. Not only them, them, but their descendants and their rel relatives that generously carry and share their stories. The struggle was made by walking and marching, a constant walk. This was the way many PAGC militants I interview describe the, being, the process of being in the, in the liberation struggle. This constant walk or march continues to this very day in, the t in time and in space. 
to symbolize this process and the constant construction and deconstruction and reconstruction of militant memories, I chose the term walking archives. Barely did I knew that the name already existed in a game card. The walking archive, archive refers, and this is a definition still in progress, to the collection of memories that is not fixed in one place or house and whose information is not constant, constant and fixed in time, but whose content are brought to life by the questions and curiosity of those interested in assessing them. I could call them oral testimonies, but the term per se, I think, does not encapsulate all the knowledge, experience, and the scars they carry everywhere they go. More, more also, it does not capture how they're how they change the history and how still change their histories. To have access to them, walk became crucial. As they walk, I walk too. In total, I recorded more than 60 conversations, several hours of memories time traveling between Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Lisbon, Berlin, Sweden, New York. And I must confess that I lost track of the number of the conversation in hours, as the learning and the meeting of new and more people were still growing. Is an it, it is an archive still on the making. In his book, Guerrilla Warfare, Che Guevara describes that a fundamental characteristic of the guerrilla group is mobility and that walking is a central aspect of this group. A man can walk 30 to 50 kilometers during night hours, and it's possible also to march during the first hours of daylight. What if what I call the walking archive continues to use this practice, these guerrilla strategies today? What if it, we, or in this case I as a researcher, approach to the walking archive using the, the practices and methods of the guerrilla warfare. Such would mean and imply a good knowledge of the surroundings, the paths of entry and escape, the possibilities of speedy maneuver, good hiding places, and naturally count to the support of people, carrying always a small notebook and a pen or a pencil for taking notes, for letters, and for communi outside communication with other guerrilla bands. My walking in Guinea-Bissau unconsciously incorporate most of these elements, meant connection, but also meant loss of trace. Meant it, I didn't kept any organized field notes of how did I encounter people. One example of this loss of trace is that I can't remember how did I met, or who put me in contact with Marcelino Mutna and Ruina Nenjata, the two PIGC students who unveiled to me their experience and memory of the schools in the mangrove. Without their memory, most likely, the film we just watched would not exist, as I could not find no record of schools in the mangroves in any of the archives I had access. Lately, and after co-producing The Mangrove School, a fabulation, an imaginary of what a school might have looked like, but also what life might, might have looked like during the struggle. I have been thinking on how to write a speculative histories, how to write speculative histories of the liberation struggle, departing from the experience of writing militant education. I think of doing this within interviews that I conducted in the past years, using walking as the speculation of what might have happened during their walk in the many textures and terrains they walked, as teachers, as military, as farmers, as doctors, as nurses, as civilians, as militants. I am also trying to reflect on my own walking during this process. How does one walk? when they walk, is the question I'm trying to answer. And how can this walk generate a different set of archives 
and therefore tell other histories, paraphrasing here Sadia Hartman's work. In this case, how the PSGC the PSG liberation struggle histories. How can I translate sparse, sparse field notes and walking in these different terrains to my writing, providing new imaginaries of these once existed places, spaces, spaces that the regular archive does not have no information about their existence. There is a hunger for other histories of the liberation struggle, a hunger that is not anymore just about the facts, but a hunger for stories that give us the tools to imagine future futures, and that involve the pragmatism and the experience of life and lives. Maybe not a combination narrative that with the present, past, and future, but more a history that allows to approach the archives as a movement and with mobility, and that allow us to speculate about the time in between, or the transitions, the absence, of the history of the liberation struggle, more specifically the PIGC and the walking archives, histories, and the histories that they shared with me. A few years ago, I was reading Arundhati Roy's book, Walking with the Comrades, and her description of walking and living in the Nasalit communist guerrillas deep within the forest of rural Chhattisgarh. I hope I didn't butcher the name. And I quote the passage. We're, we are walking in the pitch darken, darkness and that silence. I am the only one using a torch, pointed down, so all I can see in the circle of light, our comrades Kamala's bare heels in her scuffle black chapels, showing me exactly where to put my feet. This led me to think that in the dark, the archive disappears and reclaims his right to opacity, which is also a characteristic of the walking archive. Not just the, the right to opacity, but also the natural process of disappear one day from the grounds of the walking world. But Patricia Hayes also remembered me around the fire while roasting sweet potatoes, that in the dark, people feel comfortable to talk and allow themselves to be naked. I wonder about these words verbalized in the opacity of the dark night. And before I wrap up, I think it's important to share with you that part of this conversation and writing was developed during a workshop this year from South Africa crossing Namibia to the Namib Desert in the southern part of Angola in the overland, Overlander. Uh, the name of the workshop, Speculative Practice and the Politics of the Way, way Ward. Such conversation that we are having here today, or we will, will have here today, could not materialize without the amazing group of militant friends, scholars, artists, and their kids that I was with, walking in the desert, assume other proportions gives origins to other archives and other imaginaries. But that is a conversation that I will have to leave for another time. For now I close with the words of the Swedish filmmaker, Lennar Malmer, of his experience of walking with the PRC comrades in the Ghanaian terrains when filming in loco the liberation struggle and the Guinea-Bissau self-proclamation of independence, a political walk but also a collective walk. And I quote, what is a liberation struggle? People think it's a lot of shooting. The most, 99% is walking, endless walking. And it goes on day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year. And they continue into a trance in a way while you look you just take the back and the feet are walking, walking, walking. Take an example. You are walking on the path and suddenly the path divides into a fork. You go right or you go left. Not politically, but physically. You have to choose. There is no command saying you go right or you go left. Everybody sits down and talk endless discussions, 
with no hierarchy. And this is a liberation struggle. That is why the peasant is a guerrilla soldier, and the guerrilla soldier is a peasant. The whole structure of the liberation struggle is the opposite of what ordinary colonial forces are." End of quote. Thank you, Barberada and Leslie Witt for the invitation. Thank you all for joining us here today. <laughs>